Uh, today, well, we are in the Gospel of Matthew. We're in the 11th chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 19, and then we're going to skip over and look again at verses 25 through 30. So, this is Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Verses 25 through 30. At that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Verse 16, but to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. What we have there is a comparison that Christ is using between children at play and he's, what he's looking at or discussing is children that one group was wanting to play wedding. They want to sing and dance and play the flute. And another wants to play funeral. And they want to wail and mourn. But the two groups, and there may have been a third group, nobody wants to play the other's game. And then there's a group that doesn't want to play either game. And this is so much the way that we are as human beings. We, we live in our, our lives and and we're always uh, dealing with, with someone or something that's contrary, uh, and con with a contrarian, as they say. Um, I'm going to read to you a, a bit of a, of a, of a writing in this uh, commentary by William Barclay. Uh, this is one that a lot of pastors use, these commentaries. And Barclay's, I mean, they're very, they've been around forever. But Barclay it does a wonderful job. And I can't say it much better than him, so rather than trying to paraphrase his words, I will just read directly what Barclay has to say. The plain fact is that when people do not want to listen to the truth, they will easily enough find an excuse for not listening to it. They do not even try to be consistent in their criticisms. They will criticize the same person and the same institution from quite opposite grounds. If people are determined to make no response, they will remain stubbornly unresponsive, no matter what invitation is made to them. Grown men and women can be very like spoiled children who refuse to play, no matter what the game is. And we do see that in life. And here, God is using two different voices to try to appeal to the people, the masses. And the two, the two, they're very different voices, but both are being rejected by too far too many. Now, we're not going to say all, because certainly John had followers, and John had followers even after the crucifixion and the resurrection, and certainly Christ had followers, and the God, praise God does to this day. But far too many were contrarians, and no matter what angle God would take, they rejected him. This is one of the things that we're faced with today, is that we see people yet today that will reject the word of God just because they want something. That's just the way they are. And then we try and we try. This is one of the reasons why we have to have so very many different types of, of ways of reaching people. We need contemporary services, we need traditional services. Different people are led to God in different ways. It's, it's like Paul talked about being when I'm with the Romans, I'm as a Roman, and when I'm with the Jews, I'm like a Jew. Different strokes for different folks. But I'm going to leave that off for now, and I'm going to move on to verse 25 through 30. 
because that's really what I want to talk about today. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. We want to be careful there that we don't read that and think that, that only the, the simple, you know, we're children. We're going to try and say that's being simple or naive. That's not at all what they're trying to get at there at all. Whereas anyone with little children knows that when you tell them something, what's the next word out of their mouth? Why, isn't it? Go do this. Why? Children don't necessarily accept things carte blanche and just out of hand that they will immediately respond to something. That's not what they're talking about at all. But what they're talking about is the fact that children don't have these preconceived notions. They aren't invested in something. Far too often as humans, we spend a lifetime doing something a certain way or believing something a certain way or, or even in, in, in theology and in science, there's a belief in a certain thing. And so it's very difficult to, to change that belief, even in the light of the obvious need for change, even when there's overwhelming evidence that you what you need or what you need to do is to embrace this new thing. One of the saddest things I think you can encounter in a lifetime is someone that never changes their mind from the time they're a young person to the time they're old. Because no one has empirical knowledge at the age of 18 or something like that. They think they do, don't they? As you go smiling back, yes, at 18, yeah, I wish I knew everything I knew when I was 18 or 19. That would be wonderful. But you do not have empirical knowledge at that point. If you don't change your mind about things, const I shouldn't say constantly, but as you go through life, you're not thinking and you're not questioning and you're not investigating. And that's what God wants us to do. God's not afraid of thinkers. That's, never think that. Don't think that God's afraid of the scholars. God's not afraid of anyone. God says, fear not. God can handle questions. He's got big shoulders to ask questions. Only through questions can you deepen your relationship with God. Only through asking. Now, we have faith. There's some things we're not going to know in this life. We do have to accept that. But that doesn't mean that we don't be like children. We don't ask why. Why did this happen? Why did that? That's all right. Why do we believe this? Why is this? Why is what's John? What is Jesus trying to say to me here? I'm going to try to discern that. I'm try to, to, to work it out. God's got big shoulders. He can handle a three-letter word like why. So again, we, we spend too much time being entrenched in ideas. We need to be willing, like children, to think new thoughts, have new ideas. All things have been handed over to you by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. This is called the Johannian thunder, uh, or the Johannian light. Uh, this verse, is, uh, this, this, this language, this, this way of speaking is unique in the synoptics. Uh, there's no other place in the synoptics, as you'll see, is something quite like this. This sounds like it comes from the Gospel of John. This is very Johannian verbiage. Um, so this is the only way you won't see a, 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 verse, a verse quite like that in Mark or Luke and nowhere else in Matthew. I'm going to leave that behind, though, because after all, we'll come back to this in three years from now. And if I'm still here in three years, we'll have, we need to have something to preach from from the scripture. Bill smiling. I do need to have something to preach from next time. So we'll leave that behind. Come to me, all of you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. One of the most comforting pieces of scripture of all, and one that almost everyone knows, isn't it? Come to me, all of you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I don't know how many refrigerator magnets I've heard that verse or seen that verse upon, but there's been many. We take comfort from that verse. And that's the way we understand it in this day and age. But I want to present to you that the way we understand it isn't quite the way that the people that Jesus 
time to stood this. So then 29 and 30, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The verbiage for yoke, the word, the word for yoke, was a common metaphor in the rabbinic, rabbinic traditions of the rabbis, uh, rabbinic traditions of the rabbis. They talked about the yoke of Torah, the yoke of the law, the yoke of God. They're talking about what he needs to do by Torah. And each of the different rabbis would talk about what their interpretation of the scripture was, and that was described as their yoke. Their way of following God. And I talked before about the two great rabbis at the time of Christ, and I won't belabor that for you all today, but you had Belial and you had Shammai. And they both, one was conservative and one was so very liberal. And so they had these different yokes that they had. But Jesus is coming and saying, My yoke is lighter. He's getting at it. My look yoke is even lighter. So we ask ourselves, what is his yoke? There it says, for I am gentle. That means meek or humble. And humble in heart. Humble there can also be translated as lowly. So he's almost saying, I am humble and humble. He's humble not only, you know, oftentimes when we see someone that's humble, they're quite proud of their humility, aren't they? Christ is not that way. Christ is humble and lowly. I would be glad. But again, what is his yoke? For my yoke is easy. It can also be translated as good. It can be translated as the word kind. It can be translated as the word benevolent. Pleasant. But more importantly, loving. My yoke is loving. Try to work that out even more. Let's skip ahead about 11 chapters in Matthew, chapter 22, verses 36 to 40. Teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What do you hang from a yoke? You hang the rigging, don't you? The patches to the wagon or whatever you're trying to pull. From that yoke, that commandment of love hangs everything else. Love is what you use to carry the burden. Of everything else. And it's also the lens that you use to view and interpret everything else. My yoke is loving. His yoke is love. But who do we love? In that, that transaction we find about the greatest commandment is found in all three of the synoptics. And in Luke, we find a little bit more clarification. And of course, you all know I love the Gospel of Luke. I think that Luke is my favorite Gospel, I believe. Luke, after this transaction, goes on to come back with a story, doesn't he? And what is the story that he tells? It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And that's the story where we see who is this neighbor. You shall love your neighbor. Because that was, I've told you before, that was a big thing in Jesus' time. Who's my neighbor? Scripture tells me to love my neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Shammai says, it's all the Hebrew people. That's it. You only need to love the fellow Hebrews. You don't need to love the Gentiles. You don't need to love the Samaritans, what they say. You just love the Hebrews. Khalil, the liberal, believe that you love the Hebrew people and you love the Gentiles. But you don't need their, your neighbor. Your neighbor is the, is, the, is the Gentiles and the Hebrews. But it's not the Samaritans. You don't need to love them Samaritans. Because they are not your neighbor. 
This is the liberal, the most liberal of that time. Rabbi, Jesus in the story of the Good Samaritan told us what? He tells us that our neighbor is the Samaritan as well. The Samaritan is good. He dared to tell a story where the hero was a Samaritan. Those that are in need. We pray all this in your loving and your glory filled name.